introduce myself for those who don't know me. I'm uh, Grady Wright, a uh, professor in the math department here, and uh, I know most of you. This looks, looks familiar. So uh, I'm pleasure to welcome uh, my uh, guest who's visiting me uh, this week, uh, Professor Nick Trebethen from the University of Oxford. So uh, a little bit about uh, Professor Trebethen. Uh, he received his PhD from Stanford and then moved on to a postdoc at NYU and then uh, faculty positions at MIT Cornell before joining uh, the University of Oxford in 1997 as a professor and head of the numerical analysis group and also a fellow of Balliol College, the best one, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, Professor Trevethan has received numerous prizes and awards and honors throughout his career. And I'm just going to mention a few of them uh, for those who weren't at the talk, or many of you heard this at Kansas talk yesterday, but I'll repeat. Uh, so he's the winner of the first Leslie Proct uh, sorry, Leslie Fox Prize for numerical analysis, uh, which is a, a very uh, famous prize given to the best numerical analysis given every two years. Uh, he's the winner of the gold medal from the Institute of Mathematics and its Applications, the Naylor Prize from the London Mathematical Society. He's an ISI highly cited researcher. He's a past president of SIAM, which is the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, which is the largest society for applied and computational mathematicians, as well as many engineers in that uh, organization. Uh, he's a fellow of the Royal Society and also a member of the National Academy of Engineering, which was awarded to him for his work on the study of the transition to turbulence, which uh, had to deal with pseudospectra and the study of non-normal modes. Some of you may know that work. Uh, he's also the first customer to buy MATLAB, <laughs> and uh, the inventor of Chep Fun, which is uh, the talk that we give today. And uh, I mentioned this yesterday, but he's also the favorite Oxford uh, professor of my children. <laughs> they know more than one, so that's, a, that's an honor. Um, uh, professor Trevethan is the author of uh, five books, uh, that, on sort of academic-related books that range from approximation theory to numerical uh, analysis, numerical linear algebra, spectral methods, uh, and his latter book on numerical linear, his, his numerical linear algebra is, is uh, used across the country uh, for students and it's the number one seller for SIAM. And, uh, right, so uh, today he's going to tell us about CHEP fun <coughs> and its uh, many uses, and uh, I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you, Nick. Children's voice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so raise your hand if you're in engineering. Okay, and in math? I see, so sort of half and half. Uh, just a word, maybe you don't even know this, Grady, but um, my father was a mechanical engineer uh, in fluid mechanics at Tufts University. And um, I'm a lot like him, I think. Uh, at heart, I'm as much a science and engineering person as a mathematician, even though the field I work in is mathematics. I think my style is very much uh, my father's style. And if you are curious to see uh, what I looked like, what he looked like when he was younger than I am, um, there's this wonderful series of fluid mechanics movies made at MIT in the 60s. And they're still online on YouTube. And my father made the one called A Surface Tension in Fluid Mechanics. And that, it's a half hour movie. And you'll probably have a feeling it's kind of the same guy. Here I'm going to talk about step fun, but, and he's talking about surface tension, but you'll see a similarity. These movies are incredible. How many of you have seen at least one of those movies? Isn't that amazing? So they had no idea in the 60s that 50 years later, it's astonishing. Um, so, okay, I want to talk about Chet Fun, which has been a, a focus for me for the last 10 or 15 years. It, one reason it's nice to talk about it here is because Grady Wright and his former MS master student, Heather Wilbur, have been a very important part of the project. So the other hand raising that matters is how many of you are MATLAB users? Good. Um, <laughs> and all the, if any of you who have your laptops, um, by all means play along. There are various ways to download Chet Fund, but if you want the current branch, which was updated about 45 minutes ago, then <laughs> just go to GitHub and there you are. Um, how many people have used GitHub? Open source. Oh, so very impressive. Um, the, I don't get as many hand raisings on the other side of the Atlantic. I'm sorry to say. Uh, 
So Tip Fund is various things. It's a software project, and of course I'm going to show you the software. But it's also an intellectual project, even a philosophical one at some level, because it's all about taking 50 years of well-established algorithms that for discrete things like vectors and matrices and constructing continuous analogs of those algorithms. So just at the abstract mathematical level, that leads to the question of what is the continuous analog of something? For example, a vector, obviously the continuous analog of that is a function. An operation on a vector like sum, adding up the entries, well obviously the continuous analog of that is a definite integral. So there's that conceptual question of what are the right analogs of things that we know, but then there's the algorithmic issue of how can we implement them in a way that looks just like math. So the starting point of check fun is to overload MATLAB commands to give them new meanings for continuous objects. And the way I'm going to show you that is, well, I guess I'll spend a, a minute maybe at the website, but then we'll just go and play with Jetfun. So let's see, if I go to the website, there we are. Um, this was all made by one guy basically called Rothgar, who's a beautiful designer. So we're very proud of the website. Just to point out a few things, if you want to learn to use Jetfun, you go to docs. And one of the things you'll find is the chip fund guide. And you just read chapter one. And after chapter one, you'll know whether this is for you or not. So getting started with chip fund. And of course, there's many other chapters if this is for you. By the way, my view is that about at least 10% of MATLAB users in principle should know chip fund. Because any, any MATLAB person who's working with functions, as so many of them are, uh, should find this an actual tool. We're not relevant to people at sort of the data end of the world. If you're doing handling data, that's not what we do. It's functions we work with. Uh, also at the website, if I click on About, you'll see some fun things like history and people. So let's see, Grady must be there, right? There's Grady. Grady and Heather are both there. OK, so that's the Boise State usually. Um, uh, maybe the most important part of the website is examples, and these are accumulating. I think they're about 260 now. It's kind of like a numerical analysis textbook. You can see it's divided into different sections. So you know, if you want to know about Fourier analysis or integral equations or ODEs, each example will be a, a few pages long. It's a Cheb Fun code that gets published up and gives you something or other. So here I've just clicked on one at random and you can get the flavor. It talks mathematics and it shows you how to code it in Jetfire. Hello? Now we're going to play with the system. So um, everybody, even if you don't have a computer, you definitely need the handout. So um, James is in charge of the handout. Or somebody. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I'll point to at the web is the little icon for GitHub. So if I click on that, we come to the GitHub site. And for those of you who know this sort of thing, it looks just like every other open source project. You know, the open source world is on all scales. This project is much bigger than some and much smaller than some. It's a substantial, I guess you'd say, medium scale project. Um, one way in which it is extreme is, I think it is far and away the most extensive open source project written in MATLAB. That's almost a contradiction because MATLAB is a commercial language <laughs> and Fun is an open source project. And well, that's, that's the way it is. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, um, talk through about half of the commands on this sheet. So you need this sheet to see what's going on. Somebody is in charge of making sure the sheets get distributed, I trust. So I'll go back now to MATLAB. I'm talking to MATLAB. And I'll just show you this stuff. And as we go, we'll get a feeling for how things work. Um, so I'm going to start by doing something very boring, which is make a chip fun corresponding to the function x on the interval from 0 to 10. And rather than tell you what that means, let's immediately make it more complicated by saying sine of x plus sine of x squared. 
So the first thing you see is that the syntax is standard MATLAB syntax. So in particular, the dot up arrow, you know, in MATLAB that means component wise. So conceptually, you have a function of x, but whatever we're doing to that, we're doing to each value independent. So you can see that in some sense, I've constructed a thing called x on an interval, and I've computed this function of it. Now, what that function actually is, it's not a symbolic representation, it's a numerical representation. And that's what's distinctive about Chedifun. It sort of feels like symbolic computing, but it's totally numerical. And unlike symbolic computing, which tends to grind to a halt because of combinatorial explosions, Chedifun, being numerical, doesn't do that. Everything is always being rounded to 16 digits, so you don't grind to a halt. Of course, you may fail, but you, you don't fail for the reasons of the combinatorial explosion. So for example, if I said plot of f standard MATLAB syntax <coughs> were loaded here, you'll now see a bunch of dots indicating this is actually a polynomial interpolant through those points. It's, these are Chebyshev points clustered near the boundary. Chebfund is just always constructing polynomial or piecewise polynomial interpolants to get something like 16 digits of precision. So in fact, the number of dots is 119. So this is a polynomial of degree 118. And you can compute. So I can say g equals e to the f, for example. You know what that means mathematically. I've now constructed another function. There's what it looks like. It's another polynomial. If I say length of g, I see it's a polynomial of degree 919, an interpolant through a lot of Chebyshev. The whole name of the game is rounding to 16 digits. And so there's an analogy that drives us here. You know, in floating point arithmetic, you're always rounding to 64 bits in standard floating point. So everything, every number ends up being about 16 digits. If you multiply two numbers, that would be 128 digits, but it gets rounded to 64. Sorry, 64 bits, uh, 16 digits. So Chebfun is doing something analogous. Our representations are always being truncated, rounded to about 16 digits. And let me give you an indication of that. G, you can see, is a polynomial of degree 919. So what about G times G? So mathematically, that should be a polynomial of degree 1,838. So the length should be 1,839 mathematically. But it's not, because we're always rounding to get 16 digits. So we didn't need all those 1,800 coefficients. We only needed 1,100 to represent this function on this interval. So let me say a little more about how that process works. Remember, here was f. <coughs> let me now say plot coefficients of f. Now, I'm not going to use the board much, but I'll write down one thing. We have a function on an interval. Let's pretend the interval is minus 1 to 1. It's actually been transplanted to 0, 10. But suppose it's minus 1 to 1. Well, you can represent a function mathematically as an infinite series. A Chebyshev series would be the numerically sensible thing to do, like a Fourier series for periodic functions, but it's a Chebyshev series for non-periodic functions. So this is the degree k Chebyshev polynomial. It's a series involving multiples of Chebyshev polynomials. Now, what Chebfun is doing is constantly constructing finite series, which aim to approximate the function to 16 digits. And what this plot shows you is the coefficients, the absolute values of the coefficients as a function of k on a log scale. So you can see that for this function, the first 60 coefficients are size about 1. And then they begin to converge rapidly. It's a smooth function, so the Chebyshev series converges rapidly. And Chebfun has chopped the series at that point 120. To say more about that chopping process, here's what happens. A function is sampled on 17 points, a power of 2 plus 1. And then the coefficients corresponding to that sample are computed. And if they go down to machine precision, roughly speaking, we're happy. If they don't, then we sample at 33 points, and then 65 points, and so on. So we keep sampling on more and more points until the Chebyshev series behaves. And the next thing I'm going to type gives you an idea of 
how that works. Suppose I construct the same function. What was it? It's sine of x plus sine of x squared on the interval from 0 to 10. But instead of doing it adaptively, I'm going to, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to force it to be of degree 250. So normally it, it figures out the degree automatically, but I just forced it to be of degree 250. So if I say plot f2, it looks the same. But if I say plot coefficients of f2, what's happened is that it's done a polynomial of degree 249, but it's all 16 digs of arithmetic, so most of those are nonsensical anyway. You're never going to get past this point. So Ted Fund is just constantly finding that point and chopping series at that point, just like floating point arithmetic by analogy. So similarly, that was f. Suppose I do a plot coefficients of g, which was e to the f. You can see that was a longer one, so now we have 920 coefficients or something. 900 is not a big number for us. You know, let's pick a complicated function. I'll say uh, q equals Ted Fund. And, you know, great, pick a hard function. Pick one that'll be a few thousand long. Hyperbolic tangent. Uh, 1,000. That won't work. Okay. Very, very, very. <laughs> so, <laughs> Grady happens to know that the hyperbolic tangent is pretty annoying. Um, so let's say, did you say 10? I think you sure, said 10. Sure, I said 10. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is a terrible example because it, it looks simple and it isn't. Actually, that wasn't so bad. That's only a late 232. Okay, let's make it a thousand. Yeah. Think that'll work? Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I was going to say cosine. So there's a polynomial of degree um, 20,000. It's a, an annoying example. But, well, it, it's not so annoying. That's a polynomial of degree 20,000. And, you know, we have no trouble dealing with that. Um, here's another one. Suppose I say plot. Here's one of our built in examples Shem Gallery of Zigzag. Um, so that's a polynomial of degree 10,000. It doesn't look like a polynomial, but it is. Uh, so we know a lot about polynomials and how to work with them. So once you have this stuff, you can begin to um, do things with it. So for example, going back to f again, um, suppose I wanted to integrate that function over the interval. Well, conceptually, you know, that's a continuous analog of the MATLAB sum command. Of course, there's an algorithm involved, which is integrating the polynomial that's called clenshaw curtis quadrature. f is of size infinity by 1, so it's a column vector but continuous. And similarly, g is of size infinity by 1, column vector. So if I say f prime times g, well, conceptually, I have a row function times a column function, so that'll be a scalar. It's an inner product. So it's a continuous analog of the usual vector inner product. <coughs> and you can guess for all sorts of commands, if I say norm of f, that'll be the square root of the integral of the square of f. Or if I say norm of f comma infinity, that'll be the maximum value of this function. Or if I say um, cosum of f, that's the cumulative sum in MATLAB. So the continuous analog is the indefinite integral. Or if I say plot diff of f, that's the finite difference in MATLAB. The, the continuous analog is a derivative. And you know, we've overloaded all sorts of things. You want the second derivative, there it is, and so on. OK, so item four on the list is uh, root finding, which is a neat aspect of Chet Fund that turns out to be more important in practice than you might imagine, because so many things depend on it. For example, we just found the infinity norm of f. How do you do that? Well, you need the maximum. How do you get the maximum? You find the zeros of the derivative. That's what you do. So root finding comes up all the time in Chet Fund. And the algorithm we use is a one based on eigenvalues of so-called Colleen matrices. So let's just show the result. If I say, there's f. If I say r equals roots of f, I get a vector of those roots. And th this is fast and accurate, even if your polynomial of degree in the thousands, uh, we're fine with that. Um, let's show you if I say plot r against f of r as red dots, for example. So there you, you can see those roots. Um, what's the next one here? I say r equals roots of f minus 
x over 10. So if I now plot r against f of r as black dots, you can see where the curve intersects the line at slope 1 tenth. So you, you can see it's a desktop computing tool. We don't claim that this is the way to solve the Navier-Stokes equations at all. But for one-dimensional computing, it, it's just an amazing tool. And once you're in the habit of using it, you begin to wonder why you spent so many years trying to remember the MATLAB calling sequence to solve an ODE or to find a zero of a function or something. All of that just gets absorbed in this uh, uniform syntax. OK, so I've now taken you through the first like four or five years of Chet Fund. So we're now in the mid-2000 uh, and zeros, um, the mid nineties. Um, we wanted to make it a more useful tool, and that meant we had to have piecewise smooth functions as well as globally smooth functions. So that's what I'll show you next. Suppose I say hat equals 1 minus the absolute value of x minus 5 over 5. So hopefully it's obvious what that should mean mathematically. It's just another function. If I do it without a semicolon, you can see that Chen Fun regards it as a function with two pieces. There's a piece for the left half and a piece for the right half. Each has length two, so they're each linear pieces. So what we say is that a Cheb fund consists of one or more funds. A fund is a smooth piece. So this is a Cheb fund with two funds. So if I now say um, plot hat, then there you can see the, the two funds in that Cheb fund. Or suppose I say h equals the max of f and hat. I hope you know what that's going to mean. It will be the maximum of the blue curve and the black curve. So it's another function defined on the same interval. So if I say plot of h, there it is. And that's a Chet fund, 20 or 30 funds. Each is a polynomial. So half of them are just linear pieces, and the others will be of whatever degree it takes to represent that to machine precision. So in fact, if I do that without a semicolon, then h you can see a bunch of pieces alternating length 2 and length 15 or 16. The idea is that everything is, should feel the same. Even what's going on under the hood is pretty complicated at this point. But conceptually, it's just a function. And you can do all the usual stuff. So I can say you know, max of h, or the um, h evaluated at, at 6.3, or the norm of h, or the standard deviation of h, or the mean of h variance of age. You know, all this MATLAB stuff has been overloaded to work. And this is years of work, of course. You know, everything I type brings up a memory of when there was a bug in that code, you know, back in 2007, and eventually <coughs> pulled it out. That's how software is, right? Um, so optimization, as I mentioned, uh, is a matter of zero finding, really. So for example, if I said HP equals the derivative of h, and if I said extrema equals the roots of hp, and if I said plot extrema against h of extrema as black dots, I hope you know what that's going to show us. A bunch of dots at the maxima and minima. And there's a lot going on. For example, the one at the top there is a point where the derivative passes from positive to negative. The one here is a point where the derivative jumps discontinuously from negative to positive. And there's no dot here because there the derivative is jumping discontinuously from positive to positive. So of course, a lot of thinking has to go into what the right analogs are for various things for continuous functions. And of course, you can, you can do all sorts of things. Let's move on to the Boise State contribution. Um, I need to say a word about Chebyshev versus Fourier. So Fourier analysis is something everybody knows, and it's how you analyze periodic functions. Chebyshev analysis is absolutely the same, except it's transplanted to non-periodic functions. Instead of e to the i x, you get Chebyshev polynomial of x. There's, there's no interesting difference between the two mathematically. But there's a huge difference culturally, because everybody knows about Fourier, and most people don't know about Chebyshev. And worse than that, Everybody knows you can work with periodic functions reliably in all sorts of ways. 
But most people think that polynomials are very dangerous and you can't work with them. So the original mission of TEPFUN was partly just to show the world that polynomials can be counted on if you know how to work. So right from the start, we knew that instead of a CHED fund, we could have a four fund, you know, Fourier fund. But that was of no interest because it wouldn't surprise anybody. Nobody will be surprised if you have a Fourier series of size a thousand. What's the big deal? Where the polynomial of degree a thousand, not impressive. So for like ten years, we didn't even really seriously consider making a four fund. And then Grady came on sabbatical. <laughs> And uh, Grady was a little less focused on the philosophy and a little more focused on actually getting things done. And of course, in practice, a lot of functions are periodic. And it's crazy to represent them by Chebyshev series. You want to represent them by Fourier series. So um, I think you arrived without having planned what your sabbatical would be devoted to, but that's what it ended up being devoted to. So first of all, Grady did the boring but difficult work of creating the trigonometric part of Chebyshev. And then, largely after coming back to Boise, he and Heather and Alex Townsend used that in order to build disk fun on disks and sphere fun on spheres uh, involving periodic aspects. And then uh, the, maybe in the future, cylinders and balls. Um, so I'm only going to show the slightest bit of that. But for example, suppose I say F equals Chebb fun E to the sine pi X. Now, the sort of question that causes big arguments in a software team is, what do you call it? Logically, it should be 4, because that's short for Fourier, the way Cheb is short for Cheb. But 4 is a catastrophe of a word. You know, it's so confusing. Um, no. In the end, the decision we made is everywhere to say trig, because nobody's going to get confused about trig. So we call them trig funds. The periodic Cheb funds we call trig funds. So I've just made one. Uh, if I plot it, you can see a function. You can't tell that it's been represented by a Fourier series rather than Chebyshev, but it has. And for example, if I now say plot coefficients, what you see there is a Fourier series coefficients rather than Chebyshev. So Chebyshev starts from zero and goes to the right, but Fourier has zero in the middle and goes right and left. So these would correspond to the e to the i x and e to the minus i x and e to the two i x and e to the minus two i x. But the principle is the same. Whatever your function is, you're just resolving it down to machine precision. Let's do another one that's more complicated. Suppose I say f equals, and I'll make it um, a thousand pi x. Okay, so that's a more complicated function. Um, there it is. <laughs> um, let's look at the Fourier series. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so uh, you, you guys are engineers. You understand this faster than mathematicians do. Um, because of the periodicity, most of the components are mathematically zero, even though numerically they're 10 to the minus 16. And all the action, it, it looks like a previous plot, but it isn't. It's actually going up to 10,000. So there you are. OK, I'm going to stop the um, periodic now and move on to some other things. Mathematically, I love the complex plane. I don't know how anyone gets through the day without the complex plane. Uh, let me show you a silly example, which turns out to actually be more useful than you might have imagined. So suppose I said scribble. Um, you know, there is no fun like this. Um, so what this does is construct the chip fun. And I'll plot it. So if I say plot s, and I want axis equal, I think. So you see that. So now, what is that? Well, it's a piecewise linear function of a real variable. And it's a piecewise linear complex function of a real variable. So that's the real part. That's the imaginary part. So this function actually lives on the interval from minus 1 to 1. And it maps the first little bit of that interval maybe to the vertical part of the t, and then the next bit of the interval to the top of the t. So it's just a function. You know, I can say things like, what's the norm of s, or what's s evaluated at 0.3? It's just a function. What's the standard deviation? But I can also have, have fun plotting it. I can say things like plot of you know, e to the s, or e to the 3s. So there's that. Or e to the 3is. 
Um, so what's it doing? It, this is a piecewise smooth chub fund. Every little arc here is a polynomial piece. There might be a hundred or so pieces, and everyone is just doing what it has to do. Um, so at first when we did this, it seemed just silly, but it's actually a great way to visualize complex functions. So you, know, you probably don't have much of a sense of what you know, the tangent will look like, right? Um, great. So, <laughs> you know, but there it is. Um, that's not so interesting. Usually uh, putting a three in makes it more interesting, so let's do that. Um, so, you know, you can make Christmas cards all sorts of things. Now, going back to the history of Jeff Fung a little more, what we've ended up doing with it isn't what we originally were focused on. Originally, we were focused on linear algebra and matrices. And in particular, we were interested in matrices where the columns are continuous, what we call quasi-matrices. So let me show you an example of that. Suppose I make the standard check fund on the unit interval by default corresponding to x. And now let's make a quasi-matrix. And I hope you immediately know what this has got to mean. If you speak MATLAB, you know what this has to mean. It's a infinity by five object whose columns are these functions, one and x and x squared and so on. So if I say size of a, it will say, uh, did I say Oh wait, why did I do a trend? Hmm. That was a mistake. I just meant to do without that. So the size of A is infinity by 5. So it has 5 columns. And if you know the MATLAB spy command, that's been overloaded. So um, it shows you the non-zero so that you can see the 5 columns. Or if I said spy of A prime, you can see 5 rows. Um, so this is an object which mathematically is pretty straightforward. There's no great mystery about what it means. But of course, there are always algorithms you have to worry about. So if A looks like that, what does the singular value decomposition of A mean? And of course, you know, we figure that out, and there, there are the numbers. Or what does the QR factorization of A mean? So if you do that, you get uh, two objects. Um, format is short. Oh, OK, so let's do it again. Um, so the QR factorization of A consists of a Q and an R. Q has five columns in each one of the functions, so it's infinity by five. R is just a five by five discrete matrix of the usual size. So you can do all the usual stuff. You can say norm of A minus Q times R, for example, and that should be zero. Well, it's machine precision. So we overloaded a lot of this stuff, and it's beautiful and it's fascinating, but the truth is this hasn't been very useful. Nobody really seems to use this part of it. On our track, you know, we have a user group and stuff. I don't think anyone's ever asked a question about this part. Um, so there you are. It hasn't changed much even in the last 10 years. Um, but just, just to give you another sense of the conceptual aspect, so you remember A was defined like this. Suppose I plot A. Well, in MATLAB, by default, when you plot a matrix, it plots the columns. So this will plot those five functions. And you can see 1 and x and x squared. So now what if I plot Q? Q was the QR factor, the Q factor in the QR decomposition of A, which means it's an orthonormalization of these five functions. So there they are. This, these are Legendre polynomials. They're orthonormalizations of monomials. Now let me get into what is useful. Um, well, the, there are many aspects that are useful, sort of desktop just computing like a calculator, but then solving differential equations is really remarkable. And we didn't plan this because I think we assumed you couldn't possibly solve differential equations at, with a reasonable speed and accuracy. But then starting about nine years ago, we tried it and discovered it works better than we imagined. So I'll show you the syntax and then give an idea of what's happening. So to solve a differential equation, first of all, we make what we call a Cheb op. So this is a new structure in MATLAB. All of this is written in MATLAB. There's no or C or anything here. It's all pure MATLAB. Um, so we are, I think, far and away the most advanced object-oriented MATLAB project. In fact, it's funny how few object-oriented MATLAB projects there are out there. Um, so we're the ones. Um, so I make a Chebop, whatever that means. And I have to give it an operator, 
L dot op. So this is one field of that structure. And it'll be in standard MATLAB syntax, an anonymous function telling you a variable coefficient operator. So I hope this gives you an idea of what this must be. It's an operator which will apply to a ched fund u, and it will take the second derivative and then subtract x times u. And it, this will all happen on the interval from minus 20 to 20. Now, of course, we need boundary conditions. So I could say the left boundary condition is 1, and then the right boundary condition is 0. Now, James, would you please stand up and turn around? OK, so James is wearing a wonderful MATLAB t-shirt. Um, which So uh, of all the things that MATLAB does, I think one of the most beautiful is backslash. So um, Moeller, the inventor of MATLAB, had this idea that we would encode all of numerical linear algebra in this compact notation. Um, and it's, it's just so standard now, we all think in terms of backslash. So Ched Fun, of course, likes to overload things. So we figure if our goal is to solve LU equals F, then it should be possible to type U equals L backslash F. And it, let me say a word about how it does that. So you know the Chep fund concept is you sample a function at 17, 33, and so on points until you're happy. And happiness is determined by the Chebyshev series going down to machine precision. So that's what we do. The only difference is what does it mean to sample the solution to an ODE? Well, you solve it on a, on a finite grid, so you get an approximation. So we solve it using Chebyshev spectral methods on a grid of size 17. Well, I think we start at 33 and then 65 and so on. We increase the grid size until the Chebyshev coefficients go down to machine precision. Um, so if I type that, I say u equals L backslash 0. So we've just solved. Um, L u equals 0. So what is u? It's a Chebb fund of length 111. So a polynomial degree 110. If I plot it, there it is. But it's a Chebb fund, so I can do all the usual things. You know, what's the maximum value, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And as I say, we were surprised that this turned out to work more readily and efficiently and accurately than we expected. So for example, suppose I change the op. I'll put a 0.01 in front. So you know with a differential equation, when you want the solution to be more interesting, what you always do is put epsilon in front of the highest derivative, right? OK. So I just put epsilon in front of the highest derivative. If I solve it now, it still works fine. Um, there it is. It's pretty accurate, probably accurate to 12 or 13 digits. You know, I can still find the maximum. What's the length of u? Um, so it's now a polynomial of degree. 670. And you know, even this is not getting close to the limit. I'll put on another. Oh, let's really kill it. This may be a problem. I predict this will not work. But, well, I don't know. Maybe it will. Uh, but maybe not. <laughs> um, so, let's see. I'm in the water. It's trying to resolve a function now that is very, very weak. And more to the point, so resolving that function isn't the problem. The problem is that on each grid, it has to solve a system of equation. I see it, it wasn't happy. Um, oh, see, that's very unhappy. <laughs> so that really didn't work. Um, and you should never stop on a bad note. So let's at least do oh, oh, 001. That will work, I'm sure. Um, so even that's a pretty substantial task, isn't it? Because we're doing matrices of size in the thousands. Um, so our solution now is a polynomial degree 1,907. So that's not a big Chebb fund, but it's a big matrix along the way. OK, um, once you have these operators, you can do other stuff. You know, So let's go back to the simple version. If I say L dot op, I'll get rid of the small the epsilon. So we're now back to there. Suppose I say I, Isabel. So to remind you, in MATLAB, I of a matrix gives you all the eigenvalues. But you can't find all the eigenvalues of a differential operator because there are infinitely many of them. So you find finitely many of them. That's an overload of the MATLAB command I. So by default, it'll find six eigenvalues and, if you like, eigenvectors of a linear operator. If it were a nonlinear operator, I'd get an error message saying, sorry, that you need a linear operator to find eigenvalues. Um, if you happen to be a physicist at heart, um, we do fun things with the Schrodinger equation. Um, 
which is an eigenvalue problem. So suppose, for example, just to show off something, suppose I construct the x function on the interval minus 3 to 3. If I now say quantum states of the absolute value of x, then that finds by default the first 10 eigenvalues of a Schrodinger operator with that potential function absolute value of x. And then it plots them in the usual way that physicists like to plot these things. So it's a great tool if you're ever teaching you know, introductory quantum mechanics, which I'm guessing in the mechanical engineering department doesn't have to break up. OK, so we're now up to about five years ago, with 10 minutes. Um, and this is when my student Alex Townsend joined uh, Oxford. He's now at Cornell, um, assistant professor. And he single-handedly moved us into two dimensions. So people had been telling us for years that, of course, we had to go into higher dimensions, but we'd avoid it, been avoiding it. But Alex made it happen. Um, and I'll just give you a little sense of that. So suppose I say x equals chip fund 2. And now I give it an anonymous function of two variables, for example, the x function. And I could say y equals chep fund 2, anonymous function of two variables, the y function. So now on the unit square by default, I've defined two trivial functions. But as always, the point is you can compute with these. So I'm just typing what's on the sheet here. If I say e to the minus 5 times x squared plus y squared, it's obvious conceptually what that should mean. It's a function on the unit square. And I could do things like plot it. So you can see the function, or I could say contour. Um, so we have this object living on the unit square, and the idea, as always, is that anything that seems natural to a MATLAB user should be implemented, and it should be obvious what it means. So if I say f of 0 0.5, 0 0.3, well, you know what that has to mean. It should give you a number. If I say sum of f, well, f is like a matrix. If you say sum of a matrix, you get numbers for each column. So this would, in fact, give me a 1D chip file. That's not so interesting. So let's say sum 2 of f, it'll give me the double integral of this function over the box. Um, let's do some more. If I say g equals e to the f, well, of course you know what that should do. All along the way here, we're using low rank approximations to functions, which I talked about in my talk yesterday. So this one happens to be of rank 9, which means that it, it's a linear combination of nine separated terms, you know, f of x times g of y. Mathematically, it would be infinitely many, but we're compressing to machine precision. So in multiple dimensions, we now are, have carried the floating point analogy even further. We represent a function. In principle, it's infinitely complicated. But we represent it to 15 digits by a low rank approximation, adaptively figuring out the rank. Those low rank approximations are made from outer products of one dimensional chip funds. And each of those is a Chebyshev series compressed to 250 or 16 digits. Then these, in turn, involve real numbers, which, of course, on your computer are shortened to 64 bits. So we have this rounding going on in three different levels all the time, whatever you do. You know, if I say, what's the global maximum of g? It's doing whatever it has to do to find that number. It looks like e, doesn't it? Um, I guess we could have done that by hand. Um, there it is. Is that e? Um, OK, so by default, we got near 16 digits. Um, I'm not going to do all of this stuff, but um, let me remind you of the gallery. So if I say cheb.gallery2, it'll give me random examples of two-dimensional Cheb funds, which it plots in various ways. At the top, you can see the rank of each one. That's rank 3. This one must be uh, rank 4. Oh, so this one's interesting. This is from the 100-digit challenge that was ran 15 years ago or so, the Siam $100 100-digit challenge. If I say Cheb dot gallery of 2 of challenge, then it plots this function, or if I say contour of f. Um, this is a function, and the challenge was to find its minimum. So that looks complicated. But in fact, it gets more than 10 digits in less than a second in step fund 2. And the reason that happens is that although this was just invented as a complicated function, it turns out it has fairly low rank. It's down um, rank 4. If, that had, if you tilted that 45 degrees, it would be terribly difficult. But 
one's imagination is usually aligned with the x and y axes. Um, now I want to move on, so uh, I'm going to skip the vector stuff, but I encourage you to try that. I skipped section 11, but that was a mistake, so let's go back to section 11, which was nonlinear ODEs. So none of chip fun has ever been planned. I mean, that's almost literally true. We just do things, we try them out, and so far they always seem to work. It's amazing. That's what happened with trade. Um, similarly, I told you ODEs weren't planned, but then they were supposed to be good. But of course, we knew we couldn't do nonlinear. But then uh, Oscar Birkinson and Toby Driscoll realized that, well, maybe you could. And so let me take you through how you solve a nonlinear problem. If you want to find the zero of a nonlinear function, use Newton's method, which involves a derivative of the function at each iterate. If you want to find a zero of a system of equations, use Newton's method. And that means you need a Jacobian matrix at each step. So every step is solving a linear system of equations defined by a Jacobian matrix. Now, we're in this continuous conceptual framework. So we have a nonlinear differential equation. We're going to solve it by Newton's method. <laughs> so at every step, we need to linearize. And a linearization of a nonlinear differential operator is a linear differential operator. So it's not just a number or a matrix. It's an operator, which in the same Chebb fund fashion, we somehow realize on the computer. So that sounds crazy. It sounds like a beautiful idea that will never be effective computationally. And yet, amazingly, it does work. It's not as fast as the fastest software. On the other hand, it's more flexible than most of the software, um, well, all of the software that we found. Um, so you can do all this Chebop stuff for nonlinear things, too. And I could do that, but it would take so long. So I'll go into the graphical user interface, which is called Chet GUI. This was written by Oscar Birkenstein, who is now earning money in London. Um, this is what happens to most people at Oxford eventually. Um, so this is a graphical user interface to all the ODE and a bit of PDE stuff. And when you call it up, you can see it, it picks a demo at random. But let's not be random. Let's go into the demo tab. So for example, these are the built-in demos that are scalar boundary value problems. So if I say advection diffusion equation, for example, you can see the equation written there with a couple of boundary conditions. This one is linear. If I press solve, it just does what I tell you. It tries it on finer and finer grids until it finds a solution. And this is a plot of the Chebyshev coefficients, and that's a plot of the solution. If I change epsilon from 0.02 to 0.002, or even 0002, that will work for this one. Um, no problem. So now it's a Chebyshev series of length 350 with a boundary layer at the left. But you can also see through here um, some of the more complicated things. So for example, uh, suppose we go to a nonlinear problem, like here's um, a nonlinear pendulum. U double prime equals minus sine of U. With some boundary conditions, we give it an initial guess, because for a nonlinear problem, that's relevant. And if I solve it, it now does a Newton iteration. And you can see these are the size of the updates as it iterated. It took seven steps and eventually found that solution of the problem. If you play around with the demos, you can see that a different initial condition gives you a different solution. Uh, there's also lots of other neat stuff to find in there. Um, initial value problems. For example, the Lorentz equations are a famous coupled system of nonlinear equations. So let's look at that demo. Um, so there you have three equations involving variables u, v, and w. There are first order quadratic nonlinearities. And I've given it some initial conditions. If I solve that in Chebb fund, it's a completely different algorithm from a boundary value problem. It's actually using the standard MATLAB time stepper ODE113, and it's converting the result to a Chebb fund. So the final result involves polynomials of length 1500, but it was computed by this marching. And the project we're in the midst of now is writing a, a Chug Fund enabled ODE book. So it's called Exploring ODEs. It's mostly finished. It's going to be freely available. And in this book, we try to teach the subject of ODEs not algorithms at all. We don't mention algorithms except in an appendix. However, every page illustrates things. So just by using you know, backslash, basically, we show the results to all sorts of ODEs so that people can really explore the ODEs 
without exploring the algorithm. And so on this book, this is what I'm excited about now, um, what I privately am aiming at, and I, I'll say this to people, but I won't put it in print, is that the idea is that this will be a book that the top 10% of the students in any OBE class will find useful. Um, it may not be as good for the younger students because it'll be mathematically, you know, at a pretty mature level, even though it's not very technical. But for people who really get into the subject, we hope this will just be something that will transform their understanding. Okay, I just have a couple of minutes, so let me do a couple of things. Grady or anybody else, if there's a particular favor you want me not to miss. Um, the sphere. The sphere. We should got to do the sphere, don't we? I knew he's. Oh, um, yeah. And by the way, there's also some PDEs in here. You can find Scalar PDEs, and there's the Allen John equations. Um, okay. But we don't claim to be a, a real general purpose PDE software. So if I go to um, Sphere Fun, suppose, for example, that before Sphere Fun, I'll do 1D. Um, no, no, I'll go straight to Sphere <laughs> Suppose I say Cheb dot gallery 2. You remember that gave me a 2D example function, picked at random. If I say Cheb dot gallery 3, you'll get a 3D function, picked at random. I haven't shown you 3D largely because it's a lot harder to visualize, but that's a level curve of a 3D function. If I say Cheb dot gallery sphere, I'll get a random example of a Star Wars movie. <laughs> Uh, Grady and I argue about whether Chet Fun should have jokes in it like this. So far, he's winning. Uh, <laughs> uh, I could do a few more. Um, oh, that's a beautiful one. So these representations are, it's the same flavor. So it's a low rank representation, all built on one dimensional Chet Funds. But in addition, you have to somehow um, parameterize the sphere. And this is done in a double Fourier fashion. So of course, it's periodic in this direction, but they also make it periodic in that, in that direction. And it's really neat what things you can do. So um, just to rotate it around, or, oh, I'd have to undock that to rotate it, wouldn't I? Um, so you can see there, you know, they've got a function of on the sphere, and you can do all the usual things with the function. You know, suppose I say f equals Cheb dot gallery sphere. Um, What's happening? It must be a slow one. It must be a complicated one. Uh, it's the same one. I don't know why that took so long. It's a bit weird. But I could say max 2 of f, and I'll get the global maximum of that function. Um, and then we also have reaction diffusion equations in 1D, 2D, 3D, uh, on the sphere and on the disk. Um, if I say Cheb.gallery disk, I'm very much now in what Heather Wilbur did. So uh, Heather and Alex and Grady have uh, got a version of Chet Fun on the disk. So there's the tilted peg that has rank 34. There's the round peg that has rank 1 on the disk. Um, but then there are also these uh, reaction diffusion equations. So if I say, for example, spin of KDV, I get the one-dimensional Cortevay de Vries equation. And we have um, what we think are the best algorithms for these stiff PDE on periodic domain. So this is just a built-in demo for the court of eight degrees, or it won't die. Come on, die. Okay. <laughs> you know, we have other ones. Here's the kuramoto sivashinsky equation, which is a chaotic equation. Or let's finish with a couple in more dimensions. If I say spin 2 of GL2, that's a Ginsburg-Landau equation. Um, this stuff is all coded by a student of mine called Adrian Montanelli. Um, so here you're seeing in real time how we're solving this uh, reaction diffusion equation on a periodic 2D domain using methods called exponential integrators. This is not really Chep fun because that would slow you down too much. So what this does is it computes and then at the end it converts the result to a Chep fun. Um, and let's do one on the sphere. So suppose I say um, spin sphere of GL2. So this is now a Ginsburg-Landau equation on the sphere. What did I do? What did I do wrong? Oh, it's just GL. So now we're on the sphere, type space when ready. And um, so it's solving this reaction diffusion equation 
the, the amount of stuff going on there is incredible. You know, after 15 years, a software project just builds up. So we have this exponential integrator discretization. We have the double Fourier stuff. We have the low rank approximations, at least at the end. We have the uh, Chebyshev representations of the one-dimensional pieces and all of that built in floating point. I better stop. Okay. Oh, no, sorry. One more thing. Um, there's the other handout, which I'm not going to touch. But if you're curious, uh, these are a little more advanced things, some of them. So uh, if I don't tell you what they're about. Just have some fun. Play with them uh, if you're interested in see how you like. Okay, thank you very much. Legendre coefficients. 
and I want to know what are the corresponding values at Legendre points on the interval. I could say y equals um, leg coefs to leg vowels <laughs> of x. And there it is. Let's get back. I'll say x2 is now leg vowels to leg coefs of y. So I've now taken a vector of length 10,000, converted it from coefficients to values, and then back again, um, obviously very quickly. And in principle, they should be the same. I think in practice, we're going to have lost a few digits. So this should be 10 to the minus 16th. I think it'll be 10 to the minus 12th. Let's see. Um, oh, see, even worse than that. Um, but that's why we use Chebyshev to avoid these conversions. Uh, if I have one more second on that line, I'll show yeah, up. Exactly. You've all heard of Gauss quadrature. Um, you may have been told it's hard to compute the nodes and weights for Gauss quadrature. Well, let me show you. Um, let's say xs equals leg points of a million. So um, leg point leg sends from the genre. So Gauss quadrature nodes are groups of Legendre polynomials and the weights are related to that. If I do this, in 10th uh, of a second, we've just computed a million Gauss quadrature of the weights. So we really understand our, our, our orthogonal polynomials pretty much. Any ultraspherical, right? Is it's, we have the ultraspherical one, yeah. And that's... More of a software question. So are there any plans for, like, Python? Python. That's a very important and interesting question, and we debate it all the time. Um, so, first observation is that there's a core bit of MATLAB, which is sort of globally smooth, one-dimensional functions. And five or six people over the years have written that in Python. Um, the trouble is, all of Chebfun is 100 times bigger than that core. It would be a huge project to convert. So, may, I, I imagine some group or other in the next few years will but we don't have the energy to do that. I think realistically, the only way we could do that is if we abandoned the MATLAB side. And the truth is, you know, of course, Python is a bigger world than MATLAB, but for this kind of computing, it isn't. Most people who do this sort of thing, I think, are still using MATLAB. Okay, well, let's thank the speaker again.